It was almost my turn to speak in the confrontation circle. The girl to my left wrapped up her monologue about how another girl showed too much cleavage and was desperate for attention. My stomach in knots, I looked around, trying to think of something I hated about someone. The confrontation circle was a tradition at our friend group sleepovers. The host, as far as I understood, had rational legal authority over the entire seventh grade. She forced us to abide by her strict code of immoral conduct and pray to the Abercrombie and Fitch Moose. And on Saturday nights, we'd cleanse our souls of committed acts of uncoolness in the confrontation circle. It was an honor to be there, and it was hell on earth. My heart raced as Cleavage Claire wiped her tears and all eyes turned to me. I searched my mind for an out, but the one rule of the circle was that nobody could skip their turn. I never knew what to say. My braid didn't come with the inner gauge they all seemed to have about what was cool or lame, hot or slutty, funny or mean. In fact, it didn't seem like I had much in common with these girls at all, aside from our absolutely feral pubescent attraction to Chad Michael Murray. <laughs> Friendship used to be effortless and fun, silly and judgment-free. Just a couple years before, I was spending my weekends with my best friend, making prank phone calls to boys we liked, pretending to be calling from Sport Chalet and at her older brother's suggestion, telling them their extra, extra, extra small athletic cup had a shipping delay. <laughs> we never understood why they'd get so upset about that. <laughs> We'd bring our fart machine to the movie theater and wait for the quiet, serious moments to crank up the volume and give people around us concern for the state of our pants. <laughs> or we'd play games on her family computer, which we accidentally infected with a pornographic computer virus and blamed it on her older brother, completely unaware of the sort of conversations you would have to have with their parents after that. <laughs> Going into middle school, that best friend and I had grand plans for popularity, boyfriends, and more of our usual antics. But just a few weeks into the sixth grade, I got invited to a party that she wasn't invited to. I already had plans to sleep over at her house, but I was curious to see what happened at a popular kid's party. So I told her I wasn't allowed to hang out after all, and I went to the party instead. It was just a white lie, right? That's what my dad called it when he told his boss I had a dance recital so he could leave work early to go golfing. <laughs> I wanted to save her feelings since she hadn't been invited, and I didn't think skipping one of many sleepovers with her would be that big of a deal. I didn't understand why my hands trembled and I felt sick to my stomach as I told her my lie, and I certainly couldn't foresee that just a few words would break what I was intending to protect. The party wasn't even fun. I didn't know anybody there, and I found myself assuming the position of awkward wallflower, uncomfortably observing instead of joining in. They played terrible music in a sticky floored garage, the girls dancing together in a circle while most of the boys hovered nearby, watching with heavy breath and tented basketball shorts. <laughs> a, few <of> the more <laughs> a few of the more rebellious boys stood outside, huddled together around a single can of Bud Light. <laughs> <laughs> I spent the whole evening wishing my best friend was there. I still don't know who told her, but when I called her the next day, she asked coldly, so, how was the party? My heart sank, and I tried to explain, but she didn't forgive me. I spent the next couple months trying to make amends, but my calls went unreturned, and she avoided me at school. I even brought a gift to her house on her birthday and left it on the porch when she didn't answer the door. Our friendship was the cost of my lie, but karma, the biggest bitch of all, wasn't done with me yet. Lost and lonely, I was recruited to the Vampiric Council of Conformity, <laughs> where, t where teenage girls sucked the silliness and originality out of one another until they all talked and looked and acted the same in the name of popularity. This is for everyone's own good, our host had insisted about the confrontation circle, because real friends tell each other the truth. <laughs> Not this kind of truth, I thought to myself. These girls must have fancied themselves a group of tiny teenage Tony Robbinses, but instead of making you walk across hot coals, 
They just sort of shoved your face into them, shouting demonically, you're embarrassing yourself. (laughs) The conclusion made about me in the circle was that I was annoying. To be honest though, this adds up. (laughs) They'd all be talking about boys and makeup and the sex scene in the latest episode of Grey's Anatomy, and I'd be trotting back from the lunch hut with my tray, singing, I'm ready, I'm ready, like the strange little sponge I was on the inside. (laughs) Spending time with these girls always felt to me like I was trying to cover up with a hand towel. No matter how hard I tried to hide myself, someone could still catch my raw, naked weirdness on full display if they just looked from a different angle. But still, I tried. I'd shop at the stores they shopped at and laugh along with their jokes. I'd woo with everyone else when their favorite song came on, which was inexplicably Grills by Nelly. (laughs) And then I'd go home and blast Hawthorne Heights on my iPod shuffle, (laughs) finally free to be emo in peace. So there I was, in this hellish circle of misdirected hormonal rage, mustering up the courage to rip a savagely self-conscious 13-year-old a new asshole. But all I could think of in that moment were the things I hated about myself. How I sat idly by as the other girls said horrible and untrue things about each other behind their backs. How my parents had told me a couple weeks before that they were getting divorced, and all I could do about it was cry how I never seemed to say the right thing or laugh at the right jokes, and how it seemed like I was the only one there who felt like there was something wrong with confrontation circles. Even Cleavage Claire had hugged her persecutor and was ready for more drama. (laughs) Finally, I stammered nervously about how I thought one of the girls had been rude at lunch the other day and she could work on being nicer. I can't believe you think I'm rude, she retaliated, gathering the support of everyone in the room. I did my best to shrink inside myself and disappear until my turn was over. The next girl cracked her knuckles, eager to rip a new asshole. You know, as real friends do. (laughs) I must have missed an important episode of Sesame Street or something where the garbage puppet taught a lesson in frenemies. (laughs) For about half of the eighth grade, two girls that I spent the most time with thought it was hilarious to say, shut up, crap face every time I started talking or laughing. I had been told many times by my dad and brother that I was oversensitive or a poor sport when I was upset about being the butt of a joke, so I knew it was best to play along. I giggled as though I understood what was funny about keeping me silenced, theatrically locking my mouth and throwing away the invisible key. I shared less and laughed quieter. I piled on makeup to cover up the crap, but they still called me crap face. My mom noticed the way I'd claimed to be too sick to go to school more mornings than not, and the way I'd come home from sleepovers in tears, how my skirts were getting shorter, my eyeliner heavier, my temperament moodier, how my worries shifted from closet monsters and boogeymen to pimples and tummy fat. She would say to me gently and without judgment, just don't forget to stay true to yourself. Hmm, what the hell did that mean? I spent many late nights scribbling frantically into my journal, trying to sort out who I might possibly be outside of the group I was in. As though jotting down lists of school subjects and movies I enjoyed might reveal something bigger about the kind of person I was. I had spent so long silencing, discrediting, and ignoring that little inner voice that I forgot what it sounded like. In fact, I'd completely forgotten that it even existed. As I got into high school, things with the bitch brigade only got more difficult. (laughs) I'd frequently find myself home with no plans on the weekends, everyone telling me they were busy. Then come Monday, they'd all be telling new inside jokes. Once, I invited them all to a sleepover at my mom's house, thinking that maybe I just needed to make more of an effort, and then I would get invited more. They all said they were coming, 15 or so girls. But as the time they were supposed to arrive came and went, Not a single one showed up. My mom and I ate one of the 10 pizzas we had bought and cried together. I found out later they all had their own sleepover without me that night. And to make matters worse, they started a rumor next week, the next week that I screamed at a girl for not coming to my sleepover, that my niceness was fake, that I wasn't who I appeared to be. But worst of all, 
They developed a habit of simply talking over me and ignoring me, like I wasn't even there. One afternoon, I was standing in line to sign up for the Powder Puff football game, you know, where the girls play football and the boys cheerlead. The two friends I was standing there with were talking about how pathetic and annoying it was that all these random girls were also going to sign up. I glanced around at the others in line, and I spotted my former best friend, who I had lied to all those years before, standing towards the back. I felt my cheeks burn and my jaw clench. The opinions and morals and empathy and audacity they had methodically drained for me over the years came rushing back. And somewhere in the distance, a Disney Channel live studio audience cheered as I stepped onto my soapbox. I said, they aren't random girls. They like go to our school and this is a school event. They've been in our classes since kindergarten. You should try being nice to them for once. God. <laughs> I turned on my heels and walked away. The Disney Channel live studio audience went, ooh. I'm sure they laughed at me behind my back. That was an objectively cringy speech, but... At the time, it felt like an edgy epic burn, and I was proud of myself. <laughs> I, now I understood what my mom had been trying to tell me, that honoring my values feels so much better than fitting in. I never did sign up for powder puff football, and I stopped spending time with that group of girls. While lunchtime at school was awkward for a little while, I found more peace choosing to eat alone in the library than I ever did trying to fit myself into the pictureless puzzle of their social structure. Reclaiming my time, I finally began to discover hobbies I actually enjoyed. You know, normal 15-year-old girl things like attending city council meetings, <laughs> writing smutty romance novels, and drinking half-shot Cosmopolitans with my mom on Saturday nights. <laughs> <laughs> when I did find new friends, they welcomed me into their goofy little group like I was the piece I, they'd always been missing. We'd get dressed up and go trick-or-treating in the middle of May. We made a cardboard car and took it through the McDonald's drive through We'd attach a sled to the back of one of our parents' golf carts and drag each other around, an activity we called urban tubing. And to this day, they tell stories from before I was around, saying, remember when, as though I've been their friend all along. <laughs> that was Vamp first-timer, Chelsea Glazer.